You know, I hate seeing this cut off one or two inches because that's one or two inches more that could have been in the ground, right? Why are we throwing that away? We paid for the whole post, let's use the whole post. Number one callback we get, my fence is warped out everywhere. Right, it's supposed to. I mean, it literally says, we guarantee your wood fence to excessively warp, crack, twist, split, rep. Are you sure you want this? And they're like, yes. So right now, these are set at 60 inches. Uh, 66 inches gives us 30 in the ground. Uh, we're 30 inches in the ground, um, 66 out. We don't want to cut any post off. We want to utilize all the posts. In our climate, in Indiana, we have to worry about frost teeth. It's a big problem. Uh, so if you notice, what they did is they belt out the bottom of the holes to make sure that the concrete slug is bigger at the bottom than it is at the top. Because if we have a tapered hole, the ground can shrinks and contracts against that. It'll literally push that slug right up out of the ground. And then water and dirt and mud fall underneath it and then it won't go back down and that process jacks the post up out of the ground. So compaction is very, very important to have it compacted. It's very important to have uh, the bottom of the hole larger than the top in our climate. Now we also have a crew that works down in our company in Florida and in Florida, there's no frost teeth. So there's no reason to bell out holes down there, but with a sandy soil down there, we have another problem in that we have a hard time getting a solid footer because the weakest link is the soil that we're in. You guys know that, right? So down there with the soft sandy soil, we have to worry about how deep do we need to go to get enough mass or enough surface area on the slug of concrete to make sure it doesn't move. And, and ironically, what I find in Florida is that most of the competitors go shallower down there than we go here. Like that Pensacola just had that hurricane come through. Most of the fences are laying over, but they're only 15 inches in the ground. We have fences been down there, it was only a few weeks, there were 30 inches in the ground, because we use the same process, and they're still standing up straight. So it's, it's weird that down there, they should be going deeper and they go shallower. You know, digging holes down there, I did the same training down there uh, about a month or two ago, and I dug this number of holes in two minutes and 20 seconds by myself. Two minutes and 20 seconds, I couldn't believe it. It was like 11 seconds of holes. The soft soil is so sandy down there. It's nothing like this. This is really hard, really hard. I mean, it could be worse, but this is hard dirt. <laughs> for sure. You pack a pea gravel mix, you have smooth stones, they slip past each other. It's more work for the guy in the tampon bar to get a, a good compaction with that smooth stone. So what we have made by the concrete company for us, we actually put chat, like at a regular shape, um, about three eighths chat in the mix, no pea gravel. So when, we, when they're tamping that, it takes him less, tam less, compact, less work than if you go use quickcrete. It's to take a lot more work and, and this is not easy to swing that bar all day long as it is. No one likes that. So the concrete cost us actually less because we're not paying quick creep because we're making it ourselves. The only problem is you have to buy in a huge quantity to get them to do that. So we generally get two or three truckloads a week to keep up with our guys of concrete. Every, every pre-mix I've ever found is, is yeah. pea gravel. So basically, we, we could call you up and say we if you're close to me, I mean, I'll sell you all that, all this concrete mix you want for probably what you already pay. But the problem is trucking. Yeah. Like who's going to pay to truck a thousand dollars of concrete on a semi across state? I mean, it's just, you're going to pay more in trucking than the concrete's worth. And at some point it's diminishing returns. Like, okay, maybe you're better off just getting on a spud bar for an extra 20%. Yeah. You know what I mean? 15, 20 seconds. Have you marked these in the pack? So yeah, actually. There's a way that we mark that. So in a bundle, in a unit, before you move them off the bundle, it's generally nine across. So we use a tool called a straightaway, and we put that at the top of all the posts, and we use a mallet, we knock them back and forth so they're all perfectly in line on one end, because they're gonna be various lengths. Then that same tool has uh, a tape measure built on it, and instructions and a cheat sheet. Again, take the dumb out of it. They can turn it sideways, and they trace, they mark the two outside bundle posts, at their 27, 54, 66 marks, turn that same jig again 90 degrees and draw across all nine. In two minutes, you can mark out nine posts. Throw them on the side of the truck, mark out the next nine. So on an average job of 25, 30 sections, you got eight, nine minutes marking out posts, and then there's no more thinking. When they run the rails, they go to those marks. We know it's gonna be perfect. We run our pickets, we're gonna be running on top of those rails. So the whole system's gonna flow perfectly without any Nobody's scratching their heads. No one's trying to figure something out. Nobody's cutting the tops of the post off. You know, I hate seeing this cut off one or two inches because that's one or two inches more that could have been in the ground, right? 
why are we throwing that away? We paid for the whole post, let's use the whole post. Uh, but some guys are a little bit timid to try to set them to height, run their rails, and then move them because it's a lot easier just to set them all tall, throw a string line up or eyeball it, and then cut them all off. That's easier to you because you're probably used to it, not easier to you because it's easier. If we're done with the heights on this, it will not be off. We're gonna, you're gonna see we have tools to literally move these posts after the rails are on. We can drive them down, we can get a guy on both sides, now they're gonna hold onto the rail. You have to break the compaction, you gotta shake it, pull it up, and you'll gently get some concrete to fall back underneath it and drive it back down and re-tamp it. So, and that may only happen a couple of times this whole line. You may only have one or two that's low. Fix them, make it right, and then adjust the heights, make it right, slam them back down. We have a, we used to just beat the top of the post, no different than you guys do, and you worry about splintering it and smashing the top of the post. Well, with these four by fours, you can really do some damage on this, okay? So we have a protector plate that goes on here called a protector on top of that, that protects the top of this and the rail. And then we have a, a sledgehammer made where the head will be up here, but the handle's down here so that when you hit it, it's flat. You don't want to hit with the edge of the sledgehammer because the energy gets absorbed into the post. You want to smack it flat. Just no different when you're driving. You don't want to hit that thing at a, at a diagonal. You want to hit flat on top of that post to get the most impact, right? So we got tools for that. Anybody want to see this? He's not good this way. Yeah, thank you, Miguel. So notice that he's at a level this way, but he's on, he's on the marks on the cable. You see the marks down there? And so from over here, guys, I could see he was an inch, he was an inch out of alignment where he needed to be. Because those two marks on the cable is exactly where that post has to be and level. If you hit that mark, when you go to get the sections and put them in, there's no cutting. They go like a puzzle. They just pop right in all the way down. With vinyl, you do not, you have no tolerance. You cannot grow it. You can't go to Lowe's and buy a longer rail. Like it's it, you're eight foot. And we can't, if we don't want to get in the business of shrinking it all the time, one, because of all the, the labor it takes to cut a vinyl, pick it and rip it and put it in. And the amount of material you're wasting, you want to get the maximum amount of material every eight foot all the way down through there. So, so there is a difference with vinyl. There's more attention paid to those posts being exact over here, I don't care if these are off an inch, quarter inch. I use that cable to try to get them dead nuts perfect, but we're not measuring these because I nobody for the eye is going to be able to pick up that that one's 72 and a half and that one's 73 and a half. That's, no one's going to figure that out. But over here, I find a lot of guys are scared to set posts like we're doing. Most guys will put one post in, put the rail in, see on the ground where they dig the hole, dig the hole, put the post in, pop it in that rail set it and keep going down the line post panel post panel it's a very slow way to do it but people are scared to do this because what happens if you screw up one of those in the middle everyone down the line has to get pulled up and moved so i, I get why you're scared so we take the dumb out of it used to be we take a tape measure back in 93 was the first vinyl fence ever built we used a tape measure and measure the 96 on inches on centers We've come a long ways because there's a lot of error in that. I could be off a quarter inch if the post is gently leaning and I'm holding a tape measure four feet off the ground. Like, we, that's not a tolerance we can accept. So then we went to a story pole. We have an adjustable story pole in the trucks called a sure set, and it would lay on the ground. You would set the first post, lay that on the ground. It was 91 inches. It's a five inch post. It gives you 96 on centers, perfect. And you level the next post to that story pole. Once it's set, move your story pole and keep moving on. Guys have used two, two by fours for that for a long time, and they wonder why they run into a problem using a two by four. Great example is this slope right here. If you were to use a two by four as your spacer, you cut it at 91 inches long, and you lay it on the ground right there, you're good through here. But the moment you hit a little bit of grade change, the two by four itself is an inch and a half thick. So now when you hit a grade change, you're hitting this corner of the two by four and the trapezoid corner on the opposite side, and you just grew three eighths of an inch. Well, three eighths of an inch, going up a hill with the notches turns into three quarters of an inch because your rail's in a diagonal. And now your section will not fit. And now you have a bad day because now, like I told you earlier, sections don't fit, fit, and how do you fix that? You cannot get a longer section. So people get pissed off and angry about vinyl fence and it's too hard to work with instead of thinking through the process. So if you're gonna use, our, our jig has a rounded tube on the end that rotates. So we can go up hills and around corners and know that we're on the money. But if a guy takes a two by four 
cut a 45 at one end, cut a 45 at the opposite end, at the opposite direction, now you're point to point, and you can go up and down hills. It's really that easy to fix it. They just don't think about that process, right? And we're their whole, and they're got my whole company liable if they blow up a gas line, right? So they know that we don't dig, we don't use machines within two foot, period. I'm not gonna do it. Like, I don't care. I tell them all the time, I don't care if you dig with a spoon. Dig with a spoon. I'll pay you to their digger for 10 hours before I'll pay $2,000 for a hit line, right? So just take the time to dig it with a spoon. But that's when we know it's there. Oftentimes, when they hit them, it's generally because we don't know it's there, right? And that's, that's not fair to us. So generally, it slows us down. But these guys know that I don't accept that. Like, the tools we got, if they hit a power, on that, hit a power line on one post, skip it. Keep going. Like, I, don't miss a beat. Like, keep building. They can come back and fix that thing. Build everything else. I hate stopping because they're not going to pay me for the downtime. Well, that's what I was going to ask. That was my next question. Here's what I, I, I've had guys hit power lines that are six feet apart, clearly, and get a shock out of it. Now, luckily, by principle, we're all lucky that if we hit a power line, the, the easiest way to ground is in ground and down. Power doesn't travel out of ground and back into ground, right? It wants to find ground. So we're lucky in that our world, generally, we, get, we feel a little zap. We feel a little zap, but it goes in the ground, okay? We're lucky, otherwise we, a lot of us would be dead. I mean, power lines would hit. But I look at liability, like they should be on the hook for that, because like, yeah. they would hold us on the hook yeah. for damage that line, right? And I've had conversations with our utility company, Vectron, about even gas lines. We've hit gas lines, those are a huge deal. They want to fine us $10,000 in the state and make us take a class up north if we hit one, right? Well, what happens when we hit one and it's nowhere near? Who's going to pay me for the fact that he just risked his life, could have killed everyone on the job site because you didn't locate it right? Someone should compensate me for that. Yep. We have one of the issues with homeowners. If we hit the drain lines, water lines, well, that's sprinkler, the other thing. So sprinkler system. Your, your, your so utility. our contracts are four pages deep. And in that contract, we, don't, we take the time to sh explain to them what private and public utilities are two totally different things. Right. All right, so we educate the homeowner on that. Private and public are two totally different things. And it's surprising that they don't understand the difference. I have to paint the picture. I'm like, if it comes out of your home, like it comes out of your home, it's private. Coming into your home, it's generally going to be public where the meter is at the house. But if there's anything coming out of the home, that's private. Your sprinkler systems, your gas line to your barbecue, your, uh, your gutter drains, septic systems, well lines, even water lines, because generally water line meters are by the road. And we hit those all the time. So, so with our contract, it says if we hit your, if we hit a uh, utility line that's private, it's your responsibility to fix it. The, that's the problem. No, not always, because you got to mix that with how they are and social media. All right, I've got, I got some bad reviews. Right, so you can bicker and fight with them and get a plumber out there, or I can say one of my guys go get a, a, a fur and co and just fix the thing real quick, and we're done with it. Right. But and some homeowners are like, my, I got it, and that's cool. Yeah. But some are not, even though we, we told them up front, even though we did everything we could, put it in writing. Put it in writing. But I mean, that's the same battle. You gotta, you gotta weigh, is it worth them bad mouthing me all over social media because of a gutter line, yeah. or just go fix the gutter line? Sometimes I have a hard stance. If they're really an honorary person, and they're just wrong, I'll take a hard line and say, this is just the way it is. Mm -hmm. You signed it, I, that's it, I'm done talking to you. But sometimes they'll end up getting it fixed, and they'll say, I'm gonna take off $100 off your bill. And then I'll pay your balance. Now, do I want to fight that to get my 4000 from them? Yeah. Take the $100 off. Yeah. That's fine. But in return, could you do me a favor? Leave me a great review. Like, I ask for something in return. If, you're, if I'm going to give you a discount, you're going to be happy, right? All right, then do, what this, do me a favor. Get on Facebook, get on Google, give me a good review because the guy that I did not get the discount to, he made sure to give me a review that he's mad yeah. that I didn't fix his line, right? Um, the other big thing that we come into with wood fence, I know some of you guys were talking about, I don't ever use wood posts. Where's Keith? Keith Pace. Don't ever use wood posts because they warp so bad, or I don't ever use pressure to ribs, they warp so bad. Or, and they're, they're absolutely right. If you're worried about that, you need to build that, okay? So we have a contract, like I told you, it says we are not responsible for the warping. It actually says, we guarantee your fence to warp, crack, split, check, rot, this color, um, and split. We guarantee it. I'm not, not. It's like concrete, it's gonna get hard, it's gonna crack. It's gonna crack. What it's gonna do. But we take it one step further because guys are like, oh, I didn't see that in the contract. So we have another full page document that says what to expect for my wood fence. Mm -hmm. And in bold print and highlighted, it says we guarantee that fence will crack, warp, split, check, rot, deteriorate, discolor within as little as two weeks. Yeah. And you still get people to initial that, sign it, we tell them verbally, and then they number one callback we get, my fence is warped out everywhere. Right, 
It's supposed to. It's going to. Did you seal and stain it? No. That's your only way of slowing it down. It doesn't stop it. It will slow it down, I promise. And so it's on there, but then we get the reviews. We're like, what's so bad? Well, we didn't, we didn't give you a tolerance and tell you it was going to be a little bit of warping. We said you're going to have warping. Like, and so we now switch it to excessive warping. I mean, it literally says, we guarantee your wood fence to excessively warp, crack, twist, split, rep. Are you sure you want this? And they're like, yes. Okay. My neighbor's got one. So we got one guy right now. Yeah, we got one, one guy, his fence is abnormally warped, cracked, split, chip, whatever, right? Went to his house and his neighbor, 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 neighbor. And every single one of their fences look identical to his. I said, when you bought this, there's a wood privacy, wood privacy, wood, that one built by us, that was built by somebody else, that was built by someone else. So it's not us. You chose the beautifulness of warped, cracked wood fence. That's what you wanted, right? They're like, no, then why did you not buy that? Because that has a guarantee not to warp, crack, split, check this color and rot. Like you have a choice. You don't get to buy this for this price and get that quality. That's not, but if you would like, I'd tear this out and put that in. And they're like, really? Sure. Yeah. Remember the price I give you for that? You got to add tear out to it, yeah. but I'll do it. Cause I got to tear this crap out now yeah. and start over, right? There's no way to make that work. We all fight. Down you guys fight the same quality uh, issues that yeah. we, it's, and what really comes down to guys, is expectations. At the end of the day, it's the expectations of the homeowner or the customer. You have to do your due diligence up front and educate them on what they're buying. We have to use technology, show them physically, show them pictures. I'm working on right now to take it another step further. Yeah, we have the documents, right? I'm working on a video for me talking right now like this, that we're gonna send to them text and email. Sean King, thanks for buying a fence from us. I wanted to make sure you understand what's gonna happen with your wood fence. See this warping and cracking and twisting. See how much this board is warped. This is gonna, what's going to happen. Your gate is not going to open and close properly all the time. It's going to get out of alignment. It's going to twist. It's going to do this. You know, but thank you for their pride. I appreciate you buying a fence from us, but this is what it's going to look like. Like, I, I don't know how to be more clear. Give them a five-question five uh, true, true false even with then pictures. Will you? Normal, and you false. must pass this quiz. <laughs> pass well, you, you <laughs> laugh, but that's actually probably a legitimate idea because yeah, if good. we can in, improve the expectations, we all win. And they're going to say, well, I don't want that. Perfect. We have options. Yeah. We can buy a pre-stained fence. It's going to work a whole lot less. We've got other options. We can use Postmasters. It costs a little bit more money, but I guarantee it won't warp. I can use, there's a, I can go to vinyl. I mean, I, I, there's other options. And the same thing goes with vinyl. There's pros and cons to that. And they need to know that, will my lawnmower throw a rock through it? Yes. Will my son hit a, a golf ball through it? Yes. I get calls like, there's a hole in my fence. Can you guys fix it? Yeah. yeah. Is it under warranty? No. Why not? Because you, you force something through the fence. Well, I thought it was durable. It is. <laughs> It doesn't hold up to that impact. You know what I mean? So you got. I asked that question. I'm like, what happens if you hit a golf ball at the windshield of your car? What's going to happen? Yeah. Well, they're like, oh, we'll break. Oh, that's plastic. Exactly.